Good morning. Good morning. Okay, let's all stand and praise the Lord. Test, all you test. folks out there. This morning, Holy Spirit's taken us to a lot of worship. So that's what, uh, that's what uh, the music is going to portray. That's the, the script that we're going to get into. And we're starting out with I Speak Jesus. I love this song. Santo, Gloria. How many know when we speak the name of Jesus, the enemy has to flee, right? And in Jesus' name, we, we all are healed by his stripes. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Thank you, Lord. How many know that in the name of Jesus, darkness trembles? 
Hell trembles. Satan trembles. His demon trembles. And that's what we're going to be singing about.
of everyone. Praise God. Speak the name in boldness. Nothing stays the same. Heaven is waiting for the mention of a name. The spirit is moving, burning like a flame, healing the broken by the one we proclaim. Raise it up, fill the sky. Chains will fall, mountains move, we lift them high. Speak the name, the name above all other names. Speak the name, the name that when the waves obey. All of heaven's coming down, fill the earth with the sound. Hostages of shame, miracles unfolding at the mention of the name. Our darkness is fleeing, mercy running down, healing waters flowing as the lips make a sound. Raise it up, fill the sky. Chains will fall, mountains move, we lift them high. Speak the name, the name above all other names. Speak the names, the name the wind the waves obey. All of heaven's coming down, fill the earth with the sound.
a different tune than what they were singing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is a, a new song, and we didn't get it the right way, praise God, but uh, we, we will work on it. <laughs> Worthy is the Lamb. To you musicians, it was in Q minor. <laughs> this is my desire. my desire to
Good morning. Not bad. Good morning. Good morning. Praise God. This beautiful last day of April. Hallelujah. Okay, uh, a few announcements, and then we will introduce our guest speaker, a uh, man that I absolutely love. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, First of all, new attenders, anyone here has never been here before, we'd love to say hi. If you just raise your hand, we say hello. How you doing? I'm, and the gentleman back there, how you doing? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we believe that this isn't an accident. You're here for a reason, praise God. So thank you, and thank you for helping out the crew. <laughs> we have some guests from uh, uh, Full Gospel Tabernacle, a wonderful uh, church, and uh, our guest speaker, which I will introduce in a moment, is uh, Bishop Reed. Okay. Don't mind me. Hallelujah. Okay, um, first of all, this Wednesday, corporate prayer. Uh, 6.30, uh, great time of prayer, great time coming together and praying for the everything, the nation, the cities, the state, each other, the church, et cetera, et cetera. Wonderful time, Holy Spirit really moves, so it should be a real blessing. Also, uh, today is the last Sunday of the month, so we have Sunday fellowship today in the uh, fellowship room. Uh, uh, not a full lunch, all the good stuff. Uh, Cookies, donuts, et cetera, et cetera. Praise God. So after service, just out there and follow the crowd. Um, also, next week uh, we will be having a jewelry sale and a pastelitos sale. Little Irish English kids saying pastelitos. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, Evelyn, who is uh, Evelyn Gouache, who's setting this up, who is Hispanic said, I'm the only one that can turn a Hispanic name to sound like Italian or something. It's, it's Pastor Frank Monteleone's influence on me. <laughs> Praise God. So anyway, um, there's a jewelry sale. Uh, the proceeds of that are going to go to uh, a dear friend uh, who runs a uh, ministry in Kenya, Africa. Um, so we'll have more on that, but uh, that will be uh, next week. And uh, both the jewelry sale and the pastelitos will take place in the fellowship room. And Ms. Danielle, wherever you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> good morning, church family. Good morning. So, good news the walk is on. I know, isn't it amazing? 
Mrs. Clemente has worked really hard to be sure that we found a walk to join. And I just really want to encourage everyone to let's represent God from the Bread of Life Church, you know? Whether you can become a walker or donate to a walker, you know, you can see myself or Mrs. Clemente after church. Um, this is the last week before the walk because it will be next Saturday as planned, just in a different location, which I can give you all that information. Not really sure it should go out there. Stupid Antifa. Um, <laughs> but I really wanted to talk to you today about the idea of your donation. I mean, Planned Parenthood and many other abortion centers, you know, they sadly charge you to kill your unborn baby. I mean, sometimes they'll go through insurance and you won't have to pay out of pocket, but like, uh, in order to get rid of this, I need to cough up money. Where Compass Care doesn't charge for any of their services, right? I mean, that's where our donations come in. We can help cover the cost to save these women and their unborn babies. I mean, well, the Compass Care is struggling, Planned Parenthood is making a profit off of murdering the unborn and scarring these women for life. I mean, there are so many horror stories, unfortunately, about, you know, women who have had abortions and they're just, they don't get over it. And Compass Care needs these funds to help support these mothers. You know, it still costs money and you have to ask yourself, what would we pay to save these unborn babies? The most vulnerable in our, and not just congregation, in our world. Um, I mean, we all talk in the pro-life about funding adoption, not abortion. And it's a change of two letters and it just makes a world of difference. I mean, I cannot imagine what these women are going through, but even if we can't donate, we need to start spreading the word. These women need to know about Compass Care and these free caring services, you know, that are just, you know, asking for money to get, kill your baby and give you that only choice. That is all, unfortunately, the pro-abortion, not pro-choice, cares about. Like, oh, we need to be able to kill the baby. No, we need to give these mothers the love and support that they need and deserve to either put their baby up for adoption if they're not ready or to um, take care of them. That's what Compass Care does. They don't just care for you during your pregnancy. They take care of you afterwards. And I mean, how can you be opposed to that? You know, like it just wants to give you a real choice. If you see my shirt, this is from last year's Compass Care. It says, "My says save women, save lives. And that's what we need to realize. We need to help these women first and foremost. Because if we can help them, we can show them God's love. And we can provide them the resources to save their baby. And that's what I really want you guys to focus on this week. Like pray about the walk. Pray that it's successful and we don't have any issues. And pray about truly supporting Compass Care and whether you can walk or you can donate this time. So thank you so much. <laughs>
how many of you, when you sing the songs, really look at the words as you sing them? Because sometimes we can sing the song and just sing the words without entering in the spirit, but just meditating. And, and some of the things I realized as we received the tithe, we saw the picture of the cross up there. We sang the songs, and these are some of the words. You made the darkness trembled. You were victorious. Then it mentioned earthquake. Then all I could see was the cross. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, it says, and Paul said this. He said, and brethren, when I came to you, he said, I determined not to know among you anything except Jesus Christ and the cross. And you know, that's what the gospel's all about, is Jesus Christ and the cross. And he goes on and said, and I, and I was with you in weakness and in fear. We talked about overcoming fear. And my speech was not with enticing words of man's witness that your faith should be in, but in the power of the cross. And so as we worship the Lord today, let's, uh, I can't help that picture, let's do it because of what he did on the cross. I mean, like I say, it's, you know, I, I look at Good Friday as every day. You know, why? Because it's Good Sunday. Why? Because Christ crucified in the cross. Why? Because of Jesus. So the work's been done, and all we have to do is thank him for his goodness, that you and I and everybody that knows Christ knows the power of his resurrection because of him and the power of God. And that's why we need to be determined. Nothing else. And Paul said, I boast in nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. You made the darkness tremble on Good Friday, Lord. You gave us eternal life. You said it is finished. And, Father, from that day and the resurrection forward, every day we live until we go home, we are determined to put our boast in nothing but the Christ and him crucified. So therefore, Lord, as we walk this gospel out, we thank you for the message and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have this opportunity to worship you with our love for what you did by giving to you your tithe because it's holy, it's yours, and we honor you with it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hadn't planned on doing this, but uh, there was uh, <laughs> praise God. Uh, one person that is a new t attender, never been here before, uh, didn't raise his hand, and he's in the corner right over there. The new addition, uh, Richie Patrick Lungi. If you look, there's a little boy over there. <clears throat> it's a. Uh, <clears throat> Paula and Pat Brizzolero's grandson. And he's adorable. He really is. Praise God. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Father. I'm thrilled to have a, a man and woman of God here today, and I could take his uh, biography, and uh, we'd be here, if I read the whole thing, we'd probably be here till about noon or so, give or take, maybe a little bit more. I'll, I'll read a, a rendition of it. Uh, Pastor Tommy Reed began his full-time, actually it's Bishop Tommy Reed now, began his full-time ministry in 1953, serving over 10 years as an evangelist and international pastor. During this time, he conducted large citywide crusades across America, Canada, and Asia, and many other nations, as well as pastoring major churches in the Philippines and Hong Kong. At age 26, 
He became the pastor of Bethel Temple in Manila, Philippines, the largest church of his denomination. At 30, he went to Korea to work with Dr. Paul Cho as he built the largest church in Christian history with over 800,000 members. In 1963, Bishop Reed turned, returned to his hometown in Buffalo, and after a little bit, he opened up the tabernacle at Orchard Park. The first two years, uh, at the tabernacle were difficult, but six years later, God sent a spiritual awakening to the city that literally brought explosive growth to the church. And I believe it's coming the second time, in Jesus' name. The first week of the awakening, the church grew from a weekly attendance of approximately 130 people to over 800 people. Surprise, surprise, right? Think of the logistics of that, my Lord. That's wonderful, though. After experiencing this miracle of church growth, he authored the best-selling book, The Exploding Church. As the book was read by hundreds of pastors, Tommy Reed began to preach at major pastor conferences in cities all over the world and making appearances on every major Christian television network in America and Canada. Bishop Reed continued the expansion of the church in Buffalo area by opening over 10 other churches across the region. This is one of them. We are a daughter church of Pastor and, uh, Bishop and Wanda. The Brother Life Church is one of those churches. Several major mission outreaches were also built in the Philippines, Central America, Europe, as well as several cities in the United States. Bishop Reed was awarded two honorary doctorate degrees, one by Oral Roberts University and another by the California Graduate School of Theology. Today, Bishop is pursuing a new vision to teach people about their personal destiny. After authoring three other major books, he has written his latest, How to Live Out of a Dream. And today, lectures across the world, teaching people how to hear God's voice through the miracle of dreams, dreaming dreams. He believes that the language of destiny is a language of visions and dreams. He has a passion to teach people how to hear God's voice and discover their destiny. Bishop is married to the lovely Wanda Reed, who was the patriarch, yes. I, I, I'll get off script a second. I, I, I was going to say, Wanda, I, I, I love you. And when I think of you, I, I, I think of a pistol. A pistol. You are a pistol. You, you speak the word. You speak it the way it should be spoken. You, you drive demons away. Praise God. I love her. Anyway, uh, married to the lovely Wanda Reed, who was the matriarch of the tabernacle for more than 50 years. She continues to teach a Bible study that was started over 40 years ago. Wanda continues to pour her life into women guiding, uh, into women guiding prayer, teaching, and encouraging. And many of these women are successful ministries around the world. So would you welcome a man that I esteem so much and absolutely blessed to have him and his wife here today. Would you welcome Bishop Tommy Reed. Thank you. I, you know what I'd like to do is get that pulpit moved up closer to these people. I, I want to get where I can see the whites of your eyes, okay? <laughs> uh, no, I'm fine. It is good to be here this morning. Man, it's good to see you. Uh, I get here once in a while, but it's really good to be with you this morning. Well, I can't do this without turning the woman that should be preaching to you this morning. Uh, and uh, I wanted her to say something. Uh, we find when you get to, I'm 90, she's 85, so we have a little harder time getting out of chairs than we used to. <laughs> but uh, we're still doing it. Wanda? I just get myself turned around here. <laughs> it is such a joy to be here with you folks this morning. And yesterday, I don't mean to sound coy with this, but the word bread has been going over in my mind and in my heart and in my spirit. And I was reading in the Bible where Jesus said, I am the bread of life coming down from heaven. 
What, do the, what is the, actually the first kind of food to a starving person is bread. Is it not? It's usually the first generosity that is expressed to somebody who is hungry, out of work, whatever. Make sure they have bread. And on the other hand, the world today is starving spiritually. It is spiritually starving today. Many, many are not receiving from the bread of life. Sometimes they just don't even want to hear it. But deep down inside, I think that there is a heart crying out for something more in life. They know that the life they have lived or are living is not enough. It is not fulfilling the need from inside. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Oh, he that comes to me and partakes will never hunger again. It will never hunger again. And I am so glad to see you folks here because I think you're hungry. Are you hungry? Yes. Hungry for him? Are you hungry for his word to just lift it up, pick it up and read it, read it. It's your source of life. And thank you for allowing us to be with you today. We love the pastors here and this beautiful church. It is just, it is just breathtaking. So God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. I have something I'd like to give you, uh, if I could get a couple of ushers. I really believe that the reason that at 90 years of age I'm still doing what I'm doing is because I believe the Bible is the covenant that God made with me. And so what I did was took all of the scriptures concerning the covenant that we have for health and healing. Uh, I keep one of these in every one of my Bibles. I keep them on my desk at home because I like every day to take those scriptures out and begin to say, Tommy Reed, you can have health and healing because it's the word of God. At the same time, I pulled all of the, not all of them, but many of the scriptures concerning the covenant that God made with us for our prosperity. Uh, you know, you hear all kinds of people talk in, uh, in negative terms about the prosperity gospel. It is a prosperous gospel. I believe God has promised in his covenant. That's what bread of life means. The bread of life is that God is going to covenant with you. When you make a covenant with him, to give your heart to Christ, he makes a covenant with you to prosper you. So I'd like to get a couple of ushers, if you would, just to take those and uh, give one of each of them to everybody. Um, I had those printed especially for occasions like this, where I could say, this is my covenant. This is what I carry with me every place that I go. Uh, I get these brochures out every single day of my life. Uh, let me read to you uh, some of the covenant promises about prosperity. The Lord is with me, and I will prosper you. That's Genesis 39, 2. Here's another one, Deuteronomy 8, 18. The Lord has given me and you the power to create wealth. Interesting scripture. Uh, listen to this one. Return to you stronghold, O prisoners of hope. I like that, prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope today, I declare that I will restore to you double everything that Satan has stolen from you. That's the prosperity brochure. The uh, covenant of healing brochure. There are some wonderful promises here. Listen to Exodus 15, 26. I will put none, none of the diseases upon you, for I am the Lord who heals you. 
Listen to Exodus 23. I will take away from you the midst of thee, the number of thy days I will fulfill. I'll take sickness away from you. I'll fulfill your days. That's my covenant with you. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Uh, and so uh, I just think that you ought to take those two brochures and put them in your Bible and begin to live by them. Lord, we live by faith in the word of God this morning. As we take another step in our journey of faith, I pray that the next few moments will be a time when we will meet with God and hear his voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Acts chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. There's some phenomenal words in this story of Peter and John. Here's what it says. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. The gate is called beautiful. To ask alms from those who entered the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for some money, he asked for some alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive some money from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have any of that. But what I do have, I give you. I have something to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. He lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. God, take that verse and make it come to life to us today. I want to ask you a question. The question is, how are you? How do you feel? Are you sick? How is your health? If you would ask me that question, I would have to tell you that I am in perfect health. I'm still alive at 90 years of age. That is unusual to be alive when you're 90. Amen. And number two, my doctor lo walked, looked at me the other day and he said, Tommy, I can't find a thing wrong with you. <laughs> Not a thing. Now, I believe that's a result of a covenant. This book is the covenant that I have with God. I don't know how many promises there are in the world, the word of God. There are thousands of promises. But many of them are for financial blessing. They are for health. They are for healing. I believe in the healing gospel. I believe in the health gospel. I believe in the prosperity gospel. They are all promises in the word of God. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that God's covenant really works? Do you believe that the promises God made to us, this is our book. This is the covenant that God wrote for you. It's a covenant of blessing. It's a covenant of health. It's a covenant of healing. 
And I believe with all of my heart that we ought to be able to live up to that covenant. Now, Wanda's 85 and I'm 90. And we can both tell you that life is very, very good for us. We get up in the morning, we're not sick. We get up in the morning and we have perfect health as far as health is concerned. Oh, do maybe we have a few uh, arthritic uh, things? I, I don't even have that anymore. I, uh, I said, God, I'm tired of that. I, uh, I, I don't like to be creaking here in my bones anymore. This is a covenant that I have with you. The reason I have it is because I believe I live under a covenant. God says it again and again and again in his word. I am the Lord who heals you. He has promised to bless us. You could quote scripture after scripture after scripture. They are all the covenant blessings that God gives us. I am the Lord that heals you by my stripes you are healed. I covenant with you for divine health. If you look in those brochures, you would find scripture after scripture. And that's why I give them. I have these printed for you because I believe this is covenant. I believe that these are the promises that God made with me and made with you. Listen to some of them. I have set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. There hath not one word failed of his good promise. Not a single word fails of his good promise. Here's another one, Psalm 91. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I will be with him, I will deliver him, I will honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, to tell you that I have perfect faith, that would not be true. I have doubts. I have times when it's difficult. I have times when I wonder if I can believe, but I realize that I have to Choose to believe. The promises of this book outweigh any doubt, any fear that you and I have in life. It's not that we won't doubt. It's not that we won't fear. We have a choose, the, 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 the power of choice to decide whether we will doubt or we will have faith. Um. I've come here this morning to do one thing, and that's to inspire your faith. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've come here this morning to tell these people they have faith. Faith is something we choose. It is not something we automatically have. We choose to have faith. We choose to not believe our doubts, but to believe your word. And help this to be a morning when we will decide to believe. I've often told you the story, and I just want to tell it again today because it's kind of the center of how my faith works. I had a father who really believed God. Did he have any doubts? Sure he did. We all do. But he had an ability to choose his faith over his doubts. And one day, my dad walked in the house and said, we're going to go overseas. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing I realized that very first money that would be invested in buying those tickets 
was my new car. And I remember when the stoplights, the taillights of that old 54 Cadillac, it wasn't a new one, it was about two years old when we bought it, but it was my pride and joy. They drove out the, the driveway and I watched uh, Tinny Cadillac, the salesman from Tinny Cadillac, take the car. It was no longer mine. Because faith is something you have to invest in. It's not something you have automatically. It's not something you say, I'm going to believe God. You're going to believe God when they pass the offering plates. That means you have to do something. You're going to have to have faith when you maybe hear somebody on Christian television and, and they tell, talk about orphans someplace and you have to decide to support one because faith is not something you just have by choice. Faith is something you invest in. My dad took all of our money, the sale of our car, everything we had and invested it in taking a trip to the Philippines. And we got there and nothing was right. We were invited to hold meetings at the big church in Manila and suddenly the pastor had a daughter that was getting married in, in the States and they decided to leave it. So there was no place to preach. Except that one thing happened. There was nobody else in the country that could pastor the church so they chose us to pastor the church. And suddenly, we had something where all of our needs were met. How do you live by faith? Now, most of you have jobs. Most of you have an income, a fixed income of some kind or other. Maybe you're on retirement. Maybe you're on Social Security. I'll tell you, that's pretty good. Social Security is really taking care of Wanda and me. That is the provision of God. Because if our government didn't prosper, there would be no Social Security. So it is the provision of God. And if I'm here to tell you anything, I'm here to tell you one thing this morning. As a 90-year-old that stands before you, I can tell you that no matter how difficult the going gets. No matter how much it seems like you're not going to have enough, no matter how many times it seems like something happens that reverses your status in life and you lose a job or the company closes down or something happens, no matter how many times that happens, it is not a company that's your provision, it's God that's your provision. And if I could tell you anything in life, I can tell you as I stand here today that God has been my source for 90 years of my life. He always has adequate provision. Now, what do we mean by that? What can I do to tell you as I stand in front of this sacred desk this morning that God has a covenant with you. How can I make you believe that? Because the truth is, without that covenant, you wouldn't have anything anyway. Whoever provides your pension has to have money to provide it. That's God's covenant. Whatever company you retired from that company has to continue to prosper in order to give you your pension. What is that? That's the covenant of God. There's something that God has built in this whole system that has to do with his covenant, his covenant ability to provide for us. What do we do with scriptures like, I'm the Lord that healeth thee? Is that covenant? What do we do with a scripture that says, if we ask anything, anything in his name, he'll give it to us. Or the Bible says, if two or three of us agree together, he will honor that agreement and bless us. 
Does that mean anything to you? What is this? What is this book? This book is the covenant that God made with Tommy Reed and with you. You don't carry your Bible or read your Bible or put your Bible on the, uh, on the table at home and look at that and say, that's my Bible. It is your Bible, but it is also your covenant. That's why when you pick it up and you begin to read these words and they pop off the pages, the doctors have just given you a diagnosis that something's wrong with your body. Now, granted, that is true, but it's not necessarily truth. Something being true doesn't mean it's truth. Something being true, it means it exists. But there's something else that exists, and it's the covenant of this book. And I can tell you as a 90-year-old, it has always worked for us. I remember, and I think I've told you this story before, I remember the day that we took off for the Philippines. One-way ticket, no way to get home. We got there and everything went wrong. The place where we we're going to preach, the, the pastor of the church decided to leave and go back to America. We had no place to preach. And what were we going to do? In the midst of that, my dad contracted some kind of a, uh, of a fever or some kind of a something from uh, the, uh, the, the country in which we were living in, the Philippines. And uh, basically he was dying. I'll never forget the day when I walked into his room and we had, I think, two hotel rooms in the Filipinas Hotel. And I walked into his room and I looked at a dying man. He looked up at me and he said, Tommy, today's the day. I said, what's the day? Oh, the day God's going to heal me. <laughs> I looked at him and said, yeah, that doesn't look like it's going to happen, but the way you look. And uh, he said, the first thing that's going to happen, in 30 minutes, that telephone's going to ring. And the voice on the other end is going to say, you are the pastors of Bethel Temple. That will solve our financial needs. I looked at my dad and I said, you must have lost your mind. There's something wrong with the way you're thinking. Maybe it's the fever or something else. There is no way they would ask me to pastor that church. I'm just a 20-some-year-old guy that's never pastored anything. And I said to my daddy, you've never pastored a church before. They're not going to give us the largest church in the denomination. That would never happen. He said, Tommy, the phone is going to ring and we're going to be the pastors of Bethel Temple. 30 minutes later, the phone rang, and we were informed that we were the new pastors of Bethel Temple. Totally illogical. No reason we should have been chosen. I can tell you, the church had its greatest growth in its history in the years we pastored it. God is a covenant-keeping God. And I didn't come here, I got some notes, I'm not even looking at them because I knew I wasn't going to use them anyway, so I, I just knew I had to give you a testimony this morning. The testimony is that at 90 years of age, I have lived my life within the confines of a covenant. I get up in the morning, I've got a covenant. I go to bed at night, I've got a covenant. And I want to tell you one other thing about the covenant of God. It absolutely works. It's better than a pension from the largest institution in America. That could go under. God never goes under. 
There's nothing you can do to ever exhaust the resources of God. I'll never forget the day my dad looked up at me and we knew he had hours to live. And he said, Tommy, I don't have anything to leave you. I'm going to go to heaven. Uh, really what I have needs to go to your stepmother because she's taken care of your dad, as you know, for over 20 years. And so I've got to leave everything I have to her. There will be a $500 check in my will for you. Buy yourself something nice, but that's all I can leave you except for one thing. You know that your dad has always had the power to create wealth. I've always lived by faith. And he took me by the hand and said, I leave you that inheritance. You will always have the ability to know that I am the source of all things. Not your father, not a will, not an estate, but God is your source. And if I could tell you anything this morning, I would tell you that. No matter where you are, and maybe you're going through some financial difficulties. Maybe you're going through a sickness. Do you know how great God really is? Do you really know that? Do you really know that you can trust him? You're not talking about a man. You're talking about a God who spoke the universe into existence. Scientists have a hard time even imagining the size of this universe. And yet with a word, our God spoke all of it into existence. That God, that God, that creator God made a covenant with you. And it has more value than any will, even if your parents or your, the people that, that raised you or, or birthed you would be multimillionaires. They would have limited supply compared to the supply of your heavenly father. Lord, I've got to stop for a moment right now and pray that you would reveal that truth to your people. You are their father. You are their source. The God who created all the universe, you are their personal father. You told us when you were here that we could pray our father. Thank you for being our dad. Thank you for being our source. Thank you for having everything that we need because we're part of your family. And God, there's someone here that has real need this morning. Help faith to explode inside of them. Give them a miracle, even this week, that will help them realize you are their source. Thank you for being our source, our supply, everything that we need, everything we'll ever need comes from you. Thank you for being our source. If you would turn to me and you would say to me, Tommy Reed, how much are you worth? In the natural, I have no I way to even figure that out. I don't think it's very much. But in the supernatural, every one of us here who know God are heirs of a source that goes beyond our comprehension. And I would like to leave you with one single truth. It's very simple. 
I've said it again and again. God is your source. Believe him. Trust him. He's the source of this house. He's kept it alive and well all of these years. I remember uh, walking down here when they first bought the old restaurant. The part of the building, I don't, this part of the building wasn't here then. And I remember thinking, now just how in the world are they going to pay for that? Then I had to remember, I've asked that question all my life. How was I going to pay for the trip? How was I going to pay for the hotel bill? We were in Manila, and everything went wrong. My dad got sick. The meetings closed. We had no place to go. We ended up in the Filipinas Hotel running this huge hotel bill. And I said to my dad, how in the world are we going to pay the hotel bill? I don't know, he said, except for God. An evangelist came by and knew we were staying at the hotel. He checked into the same hotel. His name was Morris Sorello. And he walked in, paid our hotel bill, and left and walked out. That's the way our life has been. And I can tell you that God is your source. He's been mine. He's been ours. I said to Amy the other day, Dad can't leave you very much money, except that I can leave you what my father left me. I can leave you a source. The fact that God abundantly supplies all of your needs, according to not somebody's riches, not Rockefeller's riches, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That is our source. I'm going to take just a moment to pause. I don't know who is here in this building this morning. Somebody needs to hear this. Because in the natural, they do not have what they need. Maybe they're, maybe they've had some medical bills they can't afford. Maybe they've had some other things happen to their house, repairs they can't afford to make. God, with out any doubt, help them realize that you are our source. Everything that we need is in Christ Jesus, including the needs we have today. I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for being my source for 90 years of my life. You've provided everything I need and you still do to this very day. I will trust you. I will believe you because you've been faithful. When I was in Bible school, a lot of years ago, every morning in chapel, we sang the same song. I used to get tired of it. Brother Evans, the dean of the school, was a close friend of my parents, and I wanted to go, why do you sing the same song every morning? Five days a week, every chapel service, we say, sang the same old hymn. The hymn was, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. You change not. Thou changest not. Nothing changes in you. He is our God. And he is faithful.
Lord, I've come to the end of what you told me to say. It wasn't a great sermon. It was just an old man that has lived for you all of his life, taught by his parents that God is faithful. He's found him faithful all of his life. You provided for him for 90 years. You will provide for how many more years he has because you are a faithful God. Help us to walk out of this building relying on your faithfulness, we pray. Relying on your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. I had to... Uh, put those brochures to give you because if I could advise you anything is live by the truth and the concepts of the word of God. One brochure is for your prosperity, the other is for your healing and your health. I love some of these scriptures. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20. The God of heaven will make us prosper. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall have abundance. The blessing of the Lord shall make me rich, and there will be no sorrow added to it. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For you, then you shall make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The faithfulness of our God. Don't ever forget it faithfulness of our God. Um, I brought two of my books with me. You know, you put your life into these books. And uh, if you don't have any money, just tell a vet or Wanda to give you the books. I want to give them to you. Two books really are my life story, How to Live Out of a Dream that God put in my heart a stuttering, stammering, shy little boy. Remember the day when one of the leading pastors in America were our home. I was in my bedroom. And uh, that pastor's wife and my mother were walking by my door. And I heard that pastor's wife say to my mother, Sister Reed, please don't ever tell your son He's going to preach. He's too shy. He stutters. He can never do it. And I heard her say it. The next morning I said to my mother, I heard what she said. I heard what Charlotte said. And I know she's your friend. And my mother looked at me and said, Tommy, that's a lie. You will because of his promise. How to Live Out of a Dream is that story of a little boy that, and the, the other radical revolution is the story of the revolution that God wants to do in your life, taken out of the, of the Beatitudes. And uh, if you don't have any money, we'll give them to you. If you do have money, there's $10 a piece. They should sell for about uh, $18 each, but you can have them for $10 a piece. God be with these people this morning. Help them to know the God that I've learned to know over all these years. The God that's been so good to me, provided my cars, my houses, everything that I've had. Most of all, my health, Wanda's health. We've lived by this covenant. And Lord, we're here to testify that the 
covenant you made with us in this book, our Bible, is really true. And may we read it and devour it as God's individual promise directed to us that you are the Lord who heals us, that by your stripes we are healed, that you provide for us out of your covenant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor, I didn't even preach. I just had to talk to these people for a minute. You didn't preach. You gave us the words of life. Praise God. Thank you so much, Bishop. We're going to. I know. Please, please allow us to. Please. Oh, that was good. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Um, I'm kind of at a loss for words. All I can say is, you know what? This congregation knows God's word. You know, he says, if you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. Why? To bless you and to bless everyone around you. And some people might think, oh, another offering, I gotta give. This is an opportunity, man. This is such an opportunity to shed uh, and share and sow into the lives of two wonderful people of God. And uh, I just encourage you. Um, <laughs> a thought just come through my head. Uh, okay, Lord, do I share that one? Yeah. What came through my head is, you don't sow into this. You're dumb as a goat. You really are. Because it is good ground. It's an opportunity to bless. And, you know, at 85 and 90, these folks still go to different churches and share God's word, God's wisdom. Um, it's, it's, I'll just share this with you, Bishop. Um, it's not surprising of what you taught because uh, Holy Spirit had us start a series on covenant two weeks ago. I taught two weeks ago. Pastor Frank taught on covenant last week. You're teaching on covenant this week and I'm gonna teach on covenant next week. So, it's God's script, God's script. So Father, I thank you. I thank you for these wonderful, wonderful people of God, patriarchs of the faith. I thank you, Father, that you honored us, you blessed us with the wisdom that you have through Bishop. And Father, I just pray over this offering, Father, that as we sow, we know it goes into good ground, Father. And we just, just pray for a multiplication of that so that they can take this and sow this exactly where you want them to sow so that we get double blessings and triple blessings and quadruple blessings. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're making out a check, make it out to the Bread of Life Church. What we will do is gather everything and write one big check. Amen. Ushers. while they're taking up the offering, the Holy Spirit just put in my heart to share something. We have the honor of meeting with them on Thursday mornings at times, the pastor's prayer. And um, this might be your next book, I don't know. Pastor started sharing, we in North America pray, but it's like secondhand or third, it's, it's something over here, it's not Maine. And he started ministering uh, Thursday morning on the culture of prayer 
And I don't know where Holy Spirit's going to take you with that, but it, it penetrated my heart like nothing I've heard for a long time. And it just truly blessed me. So if you have the opportunity to talk with them, ask them about the culture of prayer. It's wonderful. Amen. Uh, remember, we have uh, munchies in the fellowship room, and you are dismissed. God bless.